Hi everybody! It's hard to believe that it's already March, but I thought I would go ahead and give you all a little bit of a bonus this month. I was at the AAEM Scientific Assembly at the beginning of the month, and I gave this presentation as part of the open mic, and so I thought I would go ahead and share it with you. By now, I'm sure you've all figured out that I'm kind of a nerd. And since I'm a nerd, one of the things that I've gotten interested in is medical myths and dogma, where they came from and why we keep doing some of these crazy things that we do. And that's how I came up with this topic, Mythbusters, but EM style. As usual, I don't have any relevant financial disclosures, but I do have a confession to make. I'm a little bit of a grammar freak, and I am a staunch supporter of the Oxford comma. So now that you know a little bit more about me, let's go ahead and get into our objectives for this discussion. Today we're going to discuss three common medical myths. Whether or not you can give cephalosporins to a patient who reports a penicillin allergy, and whether or not it's safe to give ketamine to a patient that may have a head injury. We'll also consider whether giving a single dose of IV vancomycin for cellulitis patients is beneficial, and take a few minutes to review the evidence that either supports or refutes the myth and consider how they might impact your clinical practice. So myth number one. So how often have we all taken that phone call from the pharmacy where they're calling you to say, but doctor, you can't possibly give that ceftriaxone to Mr. Smith for his UTI. Didn't you see that he reported a penicillin allergy? Well, dogma would tell us that 10 to 20% of patients who report a penicillin allergy will subsequently have an allergic reaction if given a cephalosporin. When I was looking into the literature behind this myth, I actually looked at the history of bug juice in general, and it's just fascinating stuff. We can go back as far as ancient Greece, where some physicians had figured out that they could use some certain molds to promote healing. But then we have to fast forward a few thousand years until we get to 1941 when penicillin was first industrialized for medical use. Then fast forward just a couple more decades until we get to the mid-1960s when cephalosporins were first produced for clinical use. Now, the initial manufacturing process in some ways did involve the use of penicillin, and oftentimes cephalosporins and penicillins were produced in the same facilities. Because of this, there was a lot of cross-contamination with penicillin and cephalosporins at the time, which is probably the most likely origin of this myth. But is cross-reactivity really a real phenomenon? When we actually look at the molecular structure of penicillin and cephalosporins, it's easy to understand why one might think so. They share a beta-lactam ring, and structurally, they look very similar. So theoretically, it would make sense to think that there might actually be some cross-reactivity. This is a paper that was published in JAMA in 2001. They looked at a population of patients that presented for medical care and found that about 10% of these patients reported a penicillin allergy. But what's really interesting about this paper is that when they actually asked these patients, the vast majority of these patients had absolutely no idea what their reaction to penicillin was. In fact, a lot of them just said that, well, my mom told me I was allergic when I was a kid or they reported a penicillin allergy because their sister or their cousin or someone else in their family had a penicillin allergy, and so they just assumed that meant they were allergic too. Now, all of us have also seen that patient that got treated with amoxicillin for their viral illness, and then when they broke out in their rash on day three or four of their illness, their symptoms were attributed to the penicillin rather than to their viral exanthem. In fact, when they took those patients and skin tested them, 80 to 90% of patients who reported a penicillin allergy had absolutely no reactivity on skin testing and probably aren't allergic to penicillin at all. Now this next paper that we're gonna look at is absolute genius. It's a retrospective cohort study out of the UK and the population was drawn from one of their general practice databases. They were able to source a population of just under three and a half million patients who received a prescription for penicillin. 
Out of that, they ferreted out a target population of just over half a million patients that were treated with penicillin and subsequently were treated with a cephalosporin. The study group was just under 4,000 patients who had an allergic reaction within 30 days of being treated with penicillin. When subsequently treated with a cephalosporin, 1% of those patients then had an allergic reaction. The control group included the remaining patients that did not have an allergic reaction within 30 days of being treated with penicillin. When subsequently treated with a cephalosporin, only 0.1% of those patients had an allergic reaction. Looking at this data alone, you might look at that and say, well, I can see that there might actually be something to this whole cross-reactivity thing. But here's where the real genius happens. They did exactly the same study using exactly the same source population, but instead of cephalosporin, they used sulfa. Now there is absolutely no structural similarity between penicillin and sulfa, so you would expect that the control group and the study group would have identical results. But that's not what happened here. In fact, the results completely mirrored what happened with the cephalosporin. When you looked at the population of patients that had an allergic reaction within 30 days of being treated with penicillin and then treated them with a sulfa drug, 1.5% of those patients had an allergic reaction after being treated with the sulfa drug. When you looked at the control group, which were the patients that did not have a reaction within 30 days of being treated with penicillin, only 0.2% of those patients had an allergic reaction after being treated with sulfa. Now, I'm going to grant you the point that we can't honestly guarantee that every single patient in this cohort actually had an allergic reaction to the drug, because what they looked at were all reactions that occurred within 30 days of taking the antibiotic. So how many of those were truly related to the antibiotic is unknown. However, they had exactly the same criteria across all of the different groups, and so I'm just going to let that slide for now. What they ultimately found was that there was no difference between the groups, whether they were treated with a cephalosporin or treated with sulfa. Based on that, what this really means to me is that if a patient is allergic to stuff one, they're probably more likely to be allergic to stuff two or stuff three, whereas if the patient is not allergic to stuff one, they're probably less likely to be allergic to stuff two and stuff three. Now, this is by no means the only paper that has ever looked at this. There are plenty of other studies and review articles that really have all come to the same conclusion, and that's that patients that have a penicillin allergy are more likely to react to cephalosporins, to sulfa, and pretty much to all other antibiotics or drugs besides that. Allergic patients just tend to have more allergies, and it seems that the rate of true cross-sensitivity approaches zero. So based on that, I'm going to go ahead and let Mr. Smith have his ceftriaxone, because this myth is busted. Just another example of where commas really do matter. Protect your kids, people. Let's go ahead and move on to our second myth. One of the facilities I work at happens to be a level 1 trauma center. Not that long ago, I actually had a patient come in who was polytrauma, altered mental status, and clearly needed to be intubated. And when I set up for the RSI, I asked for ketamine to do the induction. And a couple of the people in the room thought I had completely lost my mind because I was asking for ketamine in a patient with a potential head injury. In the interests of full disclosure, I've got to tell you that I love ketamine. If I thought I could get away with it, I would probably put it in the water. Ketamine is a dissociative anesthetic agent that's great because it doesn't suppress your airway reflexes and also doesn't result in respiratory depression the way so many of our other anesthetic agents do. It also has some sympathomimetic activity, which is great for any of your patients that are a little bit shocky or hypotensive. It also has the fringe benefit of being a little bit of an analgesic as well, which is really good for your trauma patients or your patients with injuries. As near as I can tell, 
you can basically put it in any orifice you want and it seems to work great so it's very easy to give and it's been on the WHO's list of essential medicines forever because it's got such a great safety profile. Now, dogma tells us that we can't use ketamine for a patient with a head injury because it'll increase the patient's ICP, and that's bad. This idea comes from the anesthesia literature more than 30 years ago, prior to really good modern monitoring capabilities. What they knew at the time was that ketamine did seem to increase cerebral oxygen consumption and also increase cerebral blood flow. Based on this, it seemed that it would cause an increase in ICP, and so it was just assumed that this had to be bad for patients with head injury. But what they didn't have was any actual clinical evidence to support the idea that this would cause patients to have a worse outcome. And in fact, nowadays there's actually ample evidence that disputes this. Ketamine has a number of advantages that make it almost ideal for use in an ED setting. And because of this, it's sort of enjoyed somewhat of a renaissance in the last 10 years. It's probably become the agent of choice for your patients that are shocky or hypoperfusing, and there really isn't any set upper age limits for its use. There is a theoretical risk about using ketamine in a patient with a known history of coronary artery disease. But despite that, I couldn't find any reports of any actual patients that had an MI as a direct result of getting ketamine. As a bottom line, if you think hypoperfusion could hurt your patient, it's probably a good option. There are a number of different papers that have actually looked at the effect of ketamine on ICP. These two papers, published in 2003 and 2005, looked at the effect of ketamine versus sufentanyl infusions on ICU patients that had undergone craniotomy for traumatic brain injury. They found that there were really no mean differences in the daily ICP or cerebral perfusion pressures between the two groups. And here's another paper that compared ketamine and fentanyl infusions in patients that had severe traumatic brain injury or who had had a subarachnoid hemorrhage as a result of an aneurysm rupture. And again, they found that there were no differences in the mean ICP or cerebral perfusion pressures in these patients. There's some really interesting new data coming out as well that ketamine does seem to help prevent secondary brain injury in these patients. Now, primary brain injury happens as a result of the impact or whatever it was that actually caused the injury in the first place, whereas the secondary brain injury occurs as the result of the hyperperfusion of the actual damaged tissue. Because ketamine has some sympathomimetic activity, it will cause an increase in mean arterial pressure, and as a result of this, an increase in cerebral perfusion pressures. This actually helps deliver blood and oxygen to the damaged tissues that need it most. There's also some interesting data suggesting that the actual NMDA receptor blockade from the ketamine may be neuroprotective. Some of this data suggests that there's a neuromodulating effect on the actual apoptosis or mechanisms of programmed cell death that occur in these damaged neurons and may actually help us salvage some of these damaged neurons. If you want some more recent data, here's another paper that was published within the last year. This meta-analysis compares ketamine to opioids in patients that have had head injury, and yet again, they found the same results. No differences in ICP levels, no differences in mean arterial pressure, or in cerebral perfusion pressure between the groups. So the bottom line here is that far from being problematic, Ketamine is probably actually an ideal sedative agent for patients that have had head injury. The NMDA receptor blockade may actually be neuroprotective, and it seems to reduce intracranial hypoperfusion and help prevent secondary brain injury. In fact, many centers are actually using this drug preferentially for RSI of their traumatic brain injury patients. So next time you need to intubate your head injured patient, it's okay if you reach for the ketamine because this myth is busted. I think at some point all of us probably thought our parents were Superman and Superwoman, but let's keep it real folks. Use a comma.
I'm sure all of you are seeing a lot of cellulitis patients in your emergency departments. I know where I work, it feels like we're seeing them like five times a shift. Because we're seeing a lot of skin and soft tissue infections, one of the things that I've seen some people do is while the patient's in the emergency department, give them a one-time dose of IV vancomycin, and then if the patient can be discharged, send them out on an oral antibiotic. So it kind of makes sense that the idea is to sort of jumpstart the patient's treatment while they're in the ED. But does this really make a difference? When we consider skin and soft tissue infections, we can kind of divide them up into two separate groups, the purulent skin and soft tissue infections and the non-purulent. Now the purulent infections are essentially your abscesses, and these days that's primarily going to be your MRSA infections. The non-purulent infections are more the cellulitis, the erysipelas, but also include that more complicated group of patients that have necrotizing fasciitis or vibrio or one of the other more complicated skin infections. When we look at how they did it in the most recent version of the IDSA guidelines on skin and soft tissue infections, they then subdivide each of those groups into mild, moderate, and severe infections. For your purulent infections, mild infections are the ones that are basically just a simple cutaneous abscess, and really the only treatment you need here is a simple IND. Moderate infections are those patients that have a purulent infection and some signs of systemic illness, but they're not toxic. You know, maybe they have a little bit of a low-grade fever or a little bit of surrounding cellulitis, but they don't look like they're shocky or toxic at all. Your severe infections, however, are the ones that really look sick. They're going to be getting admitted, and they may look shocky, they may be toxic or hypotensive, and they clearly have systemic signs of infection. This group may also have failed outpatient treatment with IND plus or minus oral antibiotics. On the flip side, the non purulent infections are subdivided more or less in the same way. Your mild infections are the patients that have a little bit of a localized cellulitis that can easily be managed as an outpatient. Moderate infections, similarly, are the patients that again have a cellulitis with some mild symptoms of systemic infection, again, maybe a little bit of a low-grade fever, perhaps a mild tachycardia, but they're not toxic and they don't look like they're shocky. And your severe infections are the ones that definitely look like they're sick and need to be admitted. These are the patients that, again, may have failed outpatient treatment, they may be immunocompromised, but they may also have signs of a deeper infection, like crepitus or bolus formation, or some other indication that this is more than just a simple cellulitis. Now, we can also subdivide the management of these infections based on those categories of mild, moderate, and severe. For mild purulent infections, again, the only management you really need is source control, so you can do your I and D and generally just send those patients out. For patients that have a more moderate infection, you'll go ahead and still get your source control, plus or minus a culture and sensitivity, and then probably add on some empiric antibiotics that have activity against MRSA, and the IDSA recommends TMP sulfa or doxycycline. For the severe infections, these are the folks that are toxic and getting admitted. Again, they're going to need source control, and this is the group where they do recommend use of IV antibiotics with activity against MRSA, such as vancomycin. Management of the non-purulent skin and soft tissue infections, again, is kind of similar to that of the purulent. For your mild infections, those patients are going to be treated with an oral antibiotic and can be managed as an outpatient. Once you get into those moderate infections, they do typically recommend use of an IV antibiotic, but look at the ones that they recommend. They're talking about using penicillins, cefazolins, clindamycin, and you'll notice that vancomycin is not on the list of options for management of a moderate infection. In fact, it's not until you get all the way over into the category of the severely ill patient that's toxic or you're ruling out necrotizing fasciitis where they're actually recommending antibiotics with activity against MRSA such as vancomycin. Now, you're probably wondering what on earth this slide is doing in this talk. <laughs> 
Well, it just so happens that this paper included a really nice discussion of the pharmacokinetics of vancomycin therapy. Now, before we go on, let me take a moment, and I just want to apologize for using a word like pharmacokinetics during an emergency medicine talk. And I'm going to get worse for just a second because I'm going to ask you all to dig real deep and go way back to second year farm class. Now, do you remember learning all that really painful stuff about how we actually measured the activity of an antibiotic against a pathogen? Well, it all comes down to that really painful graph we all had to learn, and it was all about the area under that curve. Well, after a single dose of IV vancomycin, your area under the curve gets to about 150, maybe 200. Well, in order to actually achieve bactericidal levels, you need to achieve an area under the curve of closer to 400. So that single dose of vanco you gave the patient in the ED doesn't even get you close to being clinically effective. I'm sure most of you are probably already familiar with this site, and if you're not, you probably should be. Michelle Lin's Academic Life in the Emergency Medicine blog is a really fantastic place to get good clinical pearls and just boots on the ground information about emergency medicine. There's actually a really good discussion of this on her website by, and I'm probably going to butcher the name so I apologize in advance, Zlatan Korolik, who's a PharmD that often contributes to the site. One of the things that they discuss is the fact that oral antibiotic bioavailability is great. TMP sulfa and doxycycline both approach 100% bioavailability when taken orally, and clindamycin approaches 90%. So if the whole idea is to jumpstart the patient's treatment by giving them a single dose of IV in the emergency department, it doesn't really seem like that matters very much because of the good bioavailability of oral medicines. And the other thing that I think we all need to be a little bit more cognizant of is antibiotic stewardship. Since a single dose of IV vancomycin isn't going to give you blood levels high enough to be bactericidal, we're actually promoting vancomycin resistance by doing this, and that's not something any of us wants more of. So to wrap things up, let's just make an approach based on these IDSA guidelines. For patients that have a purulent skin and soft tissue infection, if you know from the get-go that that's a patient that you're going to admit from the time you see them walk through the door, then just go ahead and give them their IV antibiotics while they're in the ED and start working on getting source control, whether that means you IND it yourself or you call your surgeon. On the flip side, if you think that you're going to be able to send that patient home, go ahead and just perform your IND in the emergency department and get the patient out of there. If your patient happens to be one of those tweeners that falls in the moderate category, like they're a poorly controlled diabetic, they're immunocompromised, or maybe they have some signs of a low-grade fever, then go ahead and just give that patient a prescription for some oral antibiotics when you send them out the door. The approach for patients with a non purulent skin and soft tissue infection is more or less the same. If you know right from the outset that you're going to admit the patient, you're done. Just go ahead and start the IV antibiotics in the ED, but save the vancomycin for the patients that actually look toxic. If it's a patient that you plan to send home, maybe you give them a first dose of PO antibiotics in the ED, or better yet, just give them their prescription as an outpatient and let them go home. Now, Say you have a patient that you initially planned to discharge, and something happens where you change your mind and decide you're going to admit that patient. No harm, no foul. Just go ahead and start your first dose of IV antibiotics at the time you decide to admit the patient. So unless you have a patient that's really sick, just hold the vanco. Single-dose vancomycin is not clinically effective, and I don't know if you've ever paid attention, but it takes absolutely forever for that dose to infuse and will delay your patient's discharge and tie up a bed for another good one to two hours in your department. IV vancomycin is also really expensive, and using single-dose vancomycin encourages drug resistance that none of us want to see. And it probably doesn't hurt to mention that it's also not recommended by the IDSA. So I think that we can all agree that this myth is busted. And to wrap it all up today, just remember folks, good punctuation could save a life. Feel free to leave me comments or shoot me email if you have any feedback or questions, and we'll see you again next time.